I'm just going to briefly introduce Hugh, and then he's going to talk, and then we'll open it up to, to questions. Um, he's going to ask, uh, why has China's economy uh, not, uh, not collapsed? Uh, and his answers may interest you. Um, they certainly interested me. And um, I think I was one of those who, uh, when, when, when hearing his answer, which was, you know, the reason it hasn't collapsed is because of traditional Chinese philosophy, we thought, oh, what on earth does he mean by that? So he's going to tell us, uh, I hope, what on earth he means by that. Um, and he's written a book as well called China's Change, which uh, is available here. And uh, I'm sure he'll be happy to sign copies afterwards. Is that right, Hugh? Um, so Hugh and I, uh, I think I first saw him, or last saw him, actually back in the early 90s in Singapore and, and Bangkok. But he came here originally as a correspondent for Reuters in 1977 uh, and then joined the uh, lamented, uh, late lamented Far East and Economic Review in 79. Uh, and then he worked in Hong Kong and KL um, as a financial and business correspondent. And then went on to work for um, uh, Merrill Lynch doing Asian research. Uh, and Dresner Kleinwart Benson. And then he founded his own uh, group, his own consulting company, ResearchWorks, in 1999. And he's providing uh, analysis and uh, advice for investors in Asia. And he now lives in uh, Shanghai um, and has done since 2002. So it's a huge pleasure to welcome Hugh Payman. Thank you very much, Hugh. Thank you very much, Victor, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. Um, I'm going to do something which, when people do it, I absolutely hate. But hands up who has read the Analects of Confucius. Yeah, not bad about what I thought. Very good. OK. Well, if you have, please don't argue with me. Um, but um, Mary from World Scientific, I have to thank you and World Scientific. Maybe there's a book, you know, a modern interpretation of Confucius? could be quite a market. Um, just as a quick preamble, two things. Essentially, I'm giving you the view of an economist, because it's the only thing that I know a little bit about, um, and uh, mainly through the eyes of an investment analyst as opposed to a pure macroeconomist. Um, the second thing is, as far as I'm concerned, there is no such thing as uh, Chinese exceptionalism. There's no special source, and there's no special uh, DNA. Um, and the one thought that for non-Chinese, uh, non-Asians, I'd like to leave with you is that some of the ideas I'll go through, in fact, many of the ideas in the book, actually are exactly the same as um, Europe and then North America used to become economically dominant um, over the previous two centuries. So that's the big, big thought for you. Um, so when I first came to live in Hong Kong in 1977, of course, the finest view was from the 14th uh, floor of Sutherland House, the old FCC premises, which is now still immortalized, not just by John le Carre and the Honorable Schoolboy, uh, but in the gentlemen's lavatories downstairs. Um, and so what was the view of China then? Well, you could see Sim Tso Choi, and on a good day you could see Lion Rock, but China was nowhere to be seen. Um, so if I then go to my first slide, what was it like in Shanghai, which I first visited in 1984. Um, well, you can see it's not just that I was a bad photographer, but it generally was quite hazy there, uh, whereas in Hong Kong it was non-existent, the view of China. Um, and what I'd like to tell you about this um, photograph um, is what this actually represents to me. Um, <clears throat> with my wife's uh, uncle, who, because he was quite a famous sports coach, was very self-confident, so we broke into um, Broadway Mansion, which was in the 1930s, maybe the largest building in Asia, certainly in Shanghai. Um, it was closed for renovation, but we paid no heed to it, so we went straight up to the top. And um, there's our niece, uh, Xu Yun, um, who still, 10 minutes later, um, is looking very shaken. Um, she was shaken because we'd been in this old 1920s uh, lift, which obviously hadn't worked very well for about uh, 60 years. Um, and most important of all, she just looked over the balcony from the 30th floor. She'd never been above the third story of a building before in rural Fujian. Um, and here she was above 30 stories. And it was that moment when she suddenly dawned, it dawned on her, what I call her Alice in Wonderland moment, when she realized that those small things beneath her were actually tall buildings. So 
what does this photo tell me? And I've got a few which really are stories rather than um, analysis. What it will uh, tell you is this, if I can get this the right way around. Have we got it? Yeah, oops. Okay, first of all, Xu Yuan had no idea that such a wor world was possible. And that would go for most uh, Chinese in the 1980s. Not absolutely all, but the majority. But for foreigners, I don't think foreigners had an idea. I hadn't a clue. Um, I lacked the perspective, um, the uh, context. And China was just far too complex. The scale was too great. So what was my main conclusion, I suppose, between then and now? It's when I delve into the philosophy and I think about it, it's basically that China still has long-term thinking. The West had it too. And the reason they have long-term thinking is it is the only way to handle complexity. Well, if I fast forward <coughs> um, just to the late 80s, this is what um, Pudong looked like. And if I turn to here, I had a pretty amazing meeting in um, the early 90s, just in a building here, um, when I was then working for Merrill Lynch. And... Um, I was seeing The Economist, and he said, my boss's boss wants you to meet him. I didn't really think about this, so I went into this room, which was probably about half the size of this room, so rather large, um, and there was just him and a couple of people, me and The Economist. Um, and there weren't any PowerPoint presentations, but he cut to the chase. He said, um, Mr. Payman, 40% of the people in Shanghai live in four square meters or less. Um, by Western definitions, he could have said three square meters. I had no idea what he was talking about. To me, that was not an uh, election-winning slogan. But to him, I worked out later, what he was telling me was, there is this incredible desire for more space, better space. And that is going to be one of the great opportunities, economic investment opportunities of the next few decades, because it will start as a pilot scheme here in Shanghai. If I can just show you. Oh, oops. Um, this is Pudong, by the way, for those of you not familiar with what it looked like. Just a load of warehouses and uh, low stories. Here is uh, Pu Si, OK? And that's the Bund along here, OK? Um, and so what did I take from that? What I took from the fact was I had no idea what was going on, but I'd really better um, listen. Was the vice mayor, because that's what he was, his title, probably the executive vice mayor, but I can't remember for sure. Um, was he right, or was my bafflement uh, justified? Well, that's what that view before became. OK? This is when you're all meant to say, wow. Um, now that is a wow moment. Um, investors would always say to me, Hugh, take us to a place with uh, the wow factor. I had no idea what would uh, wow someone until we ac were actually in uh, uh, Chongqing, I think, uh, mid uh, first decade of the century. And um, on the way in, we went from the airport into the center of uh, Chongqing. And... Um, First of all, it was incredibly quick because there was a new highway. But we'd literally driven through a forest of semi-completed high-rises and cranes. And as we got off the bus at the hotel, a normally very staid fund manager said, wow. So this is the wow factor. Then on the way back to the airport, another wowed, obviously, foreigner, South African economist, got up in the bus and he said, in the last 15 minutes... We have just passed more cranes than there are in Africa's largest economy, South Africa then. So there's a lot of wow. But of course, there's a lot of stuff that has no concept of this now. And I was just talking with Victor um, about that. <clears throat> so what have we got? First of all, I think it's important to realize that China's always been a domestic economy. We always think it's export driven. Well, that's at the margins. But if you actually add all the construction-related um, activity from uh, steel to cement to construction work itself, probably urbanization has added, all told, twice as much as um, exports. Um, but we've had urbanization on steroids 
Um, we've seen urbanization before in Hong Kong and Singapore, Korea and Japan. This is nothing new to Asia. Um, but never on this scale, and arguably the speed, although I think it's more the scale than the speed. We've seen um, Dear Proudhon go from a million people in the early 1990s to supposedly 8 million people, and it feels like that, and rising in that time. And of course, in that time, it's um, overtaken um, Singapore um, and Hong Kong in size. And Shenzhen, which of course in the 1970s was but what they call a village, although probably 30,000 people altogether, but um, a fishing village. Uh, well, now it's a global innovation hub, and we can debate about how many people actually live or uh, are resident in uh, Shenzhen, but it's far more than in Hong Kong or in Singapore. So I want to leave you with the first answer to why the economy hasn't collapsed. Um, China's modern housing construction is barely half complete. Now, people who go to coastal China just can't believe that. Um, but if you stood in my office and looked out, you can see the four-story walk-up um, apartments, which will be pulled down in the next housing cycle. There's a huge amount of upgrading, in fact, more upgrading than there will be uh, uh, expansion of the footprint of the city. Um, demand is still strong. And by my calculations, by the time everything is finished, should it ever happen, um, and uh, everyone has got a decent amount of space, um, good quality space, um, China will have twice as much space as it has today. So that's a lot to look forward to um, over the next 20 to 30 years. So what's the first lesson? China speed, but China scale. <clears throat> now, so why is China doing this so fast? Some of you will know Ag Angus uh, Madison's work, where he very bravely tries to work out global GDP by major regions. Um, and you just have to look at uh, this line here, China. Um, it was actually, uh, this is its trajectory. And it was only about 1820 that China stopped being the largest uh, country in the world by GDP. Um, everybody forgets that. So it's not as if China would be nowhere. In fact, if I look at the next one, oh yeah, so let me just go to Madison's calculations. He said in 1820, China was the world's number one economy. And by 1913, out of the 65 countries he had data for, China ranked 64th. So a pretty bad century. Um, and the next 60 odd years weren't any better. In fact, they were worse. China went from 64th to 65th out of 65. Um, so China hit rock bottom. And to use the Thatcherite expression, Tina, there is no alternative in China's case to reform and opening up. So what is China about and still is? It's essentially what started in the 19th century as a response to this initial decline, uh, which was China's quest for wealth and power. Um, if we go back much further, and some of you probably have read Ian Morris's uh, Why the West Rules for Now, um, actually, um, the East, as he calls it, which is basically China, uh, has tracked uh, the West, as he calls everything to the west of the mountains of uh, Iraq, not Western Europe, um, f back for 16,000 years. It's only in <coughs> the last 200 years that although China's gone up, Western Europe, or the West, as he calls it, has gone up even more, and much more. So I think, to me, this is the long-term perspective, and we'll come back to long-term thinking later. The fact is that these two economies have tracked each other, and um, actually here, which is um, basically, um, I suppose, the end of the Han, um, we actually have China, i.e. the East, overtaking um, the West for a period. And that period, although it went up and down, it was still ahead of the West until 1820, uh, as I say. So, for basically 1,500 years, China the East has been ahead of the West. Not hugely, but it's generally been ahead. More importantly for today is that China has done something which no other economy um, or empire, whatever we want to call it, um, has done before. Um, that is, it's actually recovered. If you think through history, um, the first major economy was Iraq, followed by Persia, uh, Egypt, Greece, 
Rome, and India, um, with China in between. But China knows how to regroup. And so we have to ask ourselves, how does it learn this? How does it recover? And that's where we have to go to traditional um, philosophy, um, in my view. So that started me thinking, what's it to do with this guy? This is um, Confucius, um, for those who don't know. <laughs> my apologies. Um, and by the way, when I say Confucianism, I'm just talking about all traditional Chinese philosophy. We don't even know if Confucius even said what uh, is written in the Analects, because it wasn't written down at the time. Um, but Confucianism. Um, but what China has, which actually is hinted at in Confucianism, but then was incorporated, is the concept of change. In fact, John Minford, the Sinologist, has had um, the guts to say that the Book of Change, the I Ching, is the Chinese book, it's certain, which itself is really commentaries on life that have been going on for almost two millennia. Um, some of the ideas, um, like Wei Xin, are 4,000 years old. So China gets change, and that's how it recovers. Of course, it also believes in cycles, so everything comes to an end, um, most especially dynasties. Um, the other thing you have to bear in mind about why do they get change is because there was a huge amount of thinking um, two and a half thousand uh, years ago uh, because China, uh, its philosophy, as I put it, was born out of disruption, violence, and misery. Um, and by one calculation, China has experienced eight out of the world's 12 bloodiest wars. And not just in ancient history. Think of the Taiping Rebellion, a mere 20 to 30 million. Um, and not even war, but non-war, like uh, the leap forward. So the fact is um, that China itself has learned that not everything goes in straight lines, something which a modern interpretation of Western progress um, seems to uh, have missed. So what's the lesson from this? China learns to manage the future by knowing the past and therefore how to change um, successfully. Um, I won't go into this uh, too much. It's in detail in the book. But I just highlight that basically there are three main parts of a process, because managing change is a process. Um, first of all, um, we have harmony. I'll just highlight two or three. But harmony is interesting. Because if you think about it, in the 19th century, why did Britain get ahead of the rest of Europe? because Britain had a century of peace, harmony, stability, whereas Europe basically had a lot of uh, revolutions and instability. Then, once you've worked out your goals, and they're different for everyone, um, it's a question of the means. First of all, you have to crystallize the idea. And to me, the big takeaway is long-term thinking. And we'll come to that in a moment. But also gradualism and sequencing are very important. And then people, what traditional societies uh, in China would call the elite, today we call key persons. But it's the same concept. So we have a three-part um, framework. And there I just repeat them again. <clears throat> so this is about policy, OK? It's about the pro sorry, it's about process. It's not about policy. Um, policy is what. Um, uh, policy wonks in think tanks come up with today, um, everywhere in the world. Uh, but process is something which most people don't even think about. Okay, so take rural China. I took this picture in my wife's uh, village in rural Fujian. Uh, but you could be forgiven for thinking this is a biblical scene, or in Africa today, or um, the Andes. Let me just go back to the picture, because I'm going to tell you a story here. So um, back in the early 90s, um, rural China had been on an absolute tear since 1978 with reform and opening up. Um, incomes had been rising every year. Um, but then suddenly they stopped, uh, because uh, urban China uh, was plagued by inflation, the price, the price of everything from basic commodities um, through to um, <clears throat> simple utensils uh, were shooting up. 
And so it was the turn of urban China to be given a break. And so when we went to the village, um, cousin was uh, complaining. So next time I was in Beijing, I said to the official, very senior official, I said, so what will Beijing do um, for rural uh, Fujianese farmers uh, so that uh, this trend uh, can be ameliorated? I didn't even say stopped and reversed. And I expected to get a long, long list of policies. Um, in fact, I just got a very short question. Hugh, what percentage of people in England farm today? So I hazarded a guess at about 3 to 5%. And she said, yeah. Well, one day, she didn't even specify the century, let alone uh, the year or decade. She said, China will be approaching that one day. That was sort of the answer. What she was saying is, we take the long term, and we've done our thinking as to how we get to that point where we're like developed agriculture in the Western world. And then everything else falls um, into place. Um, so that was um, quite a message to me. Um, about a decade later, I was uh, in Beijing um, seeing the same person. And it was one of those glorious black days at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Um, and so I said, um, environmental degradation. Um, when, when does Beijing do something uh, about uh, the air pollution? And the person said, well, you have to think of it like this. When there's a major problem, it will happen in three phases. First of all, it will appear somewhere in one of the five-year programs, as China calls them, not plans. Um, but most people don't notice it. But it gives cover if people want to do some experiments. And if those experiments turn out well, then in the second uh, phase, uh, it'll become quite a prominent in the uh, five-year plan. But people still don't have to implement it unless they want to. It's only in the third stage. Well, I thought there is no way that with um, a black afternoon uh, in Beijing that people would put up, put up with this. Uh, well, how wrong I was. And it really was only about 10 years later uh, when things got so bad that Beijing actually had to act. And when they act, of course, not all the time, but they can be quite effective. And although I rarely use uh, data for these things, the fact is that Beijing's uh, uh, <clears throat> PM under 2.5 is down 40%. The average for major cities is down 22% in three years. It's still way above what WHO says. But this comes to my next lesson. Uh, when I was first writing a book, uh, co-authoring it in the early 70s, um, I knew nothing about China, um, and the person I was writing it with knew a lot about Africa. So guess who got to do China? Um, so I had to find someone who knew about China. This is during the Cultural Revolution. There weren't a lot of people walking around England with knowledge of China. Um, anyway, we found someone who was doing a PhD thesis um, on Sino-Pakistan foreign policy. So I thought he must be my guru. So I went to see him. And he told me so much, I didn't understand most of it. But there was one thing he said which caught my attention, and I had no idea what he meant. It took me 25 years to work it out. He says, you have to understand that the basic unit of time in China is one decade. Um, and basically, I worked out much later, well, the reason for that is, um, first of all, the complexity of China, the fact that people live in different, not just decades, they live in different centuries in different parts of uh, China. But it's so enormous. But if people don't address a major problem within a decade, then you know the dynasty could be overthrown. So when people say, why hasn't this happened? It's a question of, well, it's all about gradualism. It's not going to happen um, overnight. And a lot of these things have started you know, 5, 10, 15 years ago. Um, so does it work? Well, not within 10 years, necessarily. Um, so. Some of the things like poverty alleviation, urbanization, um, literacy, illiteracy, um, take many decades. And the environment is just one of a fairly substantial list. So we still see it. So that had me thinking. I thought, hmm, are people really going to put up with this for very long? But then I had one of those great insights eight days after Margaret Thatcher uh, was uh, had resigned. Uh, we were in rural uh, Fujian on the top of um, a three-story building 
which wasn't looking at the polluted um, and sterile uh, orchards anymore, uh, but was another side of the village which had a very fine view of the rolling hillocks and bamboo glens um, of rural Fujian. When suddenly, eldest uncle, whose house it was, said to my wife, what impact do you think the overthrow of Margaret Thatcher will have on the development of British politics? I literally went weak at the knees. I thought, my God, how does he even know this? Let alone, why is he asking me the question? And, you know, I studied PPE. I mean, that doesn't mean very much. But the fact is, I did study politics. And I hadn't thought in those terms. But someone in rural China, or however many, 6,000 miles away, had got that in eight days. And as I said to a friend of mine, I don't remember anyone in rural Herefordshire saying to me, what impact do you think that the death of Mao Zedong will have upon the development of uh, Chinese politics eight days after his death? Anyway, so... What are we talking about here? First of all, somebody in the village who, as far as I know, has never been outside the province, relatives have, um, is very aware, not just of China, but the wider world, in 1990. So then I, then I have to think to myself, well, how did he even get to think about this? And I realized that inside his head, he's got a personal computer, and that's the way people survive, OK? They're constantly reviewing developments with that idea of Wei Xin. And also, that contrary to the normal Western way of looking at Chinese politics, which is always referred to as elite politics, he was decidedly non-elite. But most people, I couldn't give you a number, but let's just say many people track progress. So what's the lesson from this? How closed is China? Also. A related point, as a colleague always said to me when I said with incredulity about something I'd observed in China, never underestimate China. So we'll come back to Churchill. So can we actually learn anything from China? Well, the obvious answer to that is what well, we have in the past. Not just the um, Asian uh, <coughs> economic miracle, um, uh, but also in the West. For those of you who in this room may remember, uh, yes, Minister, why was Sir Humphrey called a Mandarin? Very simple. Because in 85, 1855, when the British were trying to reform their very venal and uh, incompetent uh, civil service, uh, they went to the East India Company, which for 50 years had reformed itself. And that was that they based it on the concept of meritocracy and public exams for top posts, which only started in 605 in China. Um, so why was he called a Mandarin? Well, because in Whitehall and in uh, Westminster, it was always referred to, this reform, as the Chinese principle, meritocracy. And there's still elements today. But what about that? So that's 19th century, a long time ago. What about uh, more recent times? Well, universal, the U UN uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights. I won't even ask how many people have read the first paragraph. Um, but you, if you do... Um, you'll find that Mencius is uh, uh, mentioned. Um, run, the concept of benevolence, and that's what government uh, should rule with. Um, and as um, Chang Peng Chun, who was one of the key formulators um, of the declaration in 1948, pre-China, but pre-Chinese uh, People's Republic, Republic um, but still quoted today, um, he said that when the West was first thinking about human rights, they were reading Chinese philosophy. And Voltaire, Chesney, and Diderot were quite in awe of elements of it. Some people just picked bits here and there. So let me just go back, if I can, to Churchill. So what's Ch Churchill's contribution? Uh, well, he actually sent um, Joseph Needham to Chongqing during the war. Um, 1943, I think it was. Simon Winchester writes it beautifully. Um, and he tells a story about Needham uh, going to Chongqing. First of all, he flies to India, and then he has to go over the hump from Calcutta. And he was in a battered DC something. Um, and obviously thought he was never going to get to Chongqing. Anyway, he did. And so the British um, uh, ambassador then uh, said to him, well, relax in the garden, and we'll meet up probably for a snifter and then dinner. Um, and so he was um, standing there. He was sitting there, and he suddenly noticed that um, 
the gardener was grafting. Well, he knew about grafting, and he was, knew that the gardener was doing it all wrong, completely wrong. But then it dawned on him two things. First of all, he was the head gardener at the ambassador's residence. But secondly, China had been growing fruit far longer than Britain. So he came to the conclusion, and this is my last lesson here, is that different can just be different, not wrong. A lesson which a lot of people find very difficult uh, to understand. So now I quote, some of you will know Lucy Shin uh, and his, his, um, his books, sci-fi books. Um, he has a great quote where he says, apart from, um, let me just uh, get the right quote because it's too nice to uh, uh, misread. Oh dear, sorry. Can I have someone to tell me what I've just hit? I, I, yeah, I'm not going to touch a button in case it's uh, all wrong. Anyway, this gives me a chance to find the quote. It says, <clears throat> other than stable eras, all times are chaotic eras. In the, it's morning, but sun does not always rise in the morning. So I think that's a pretty good um, <coughs> synopsis of where we are today. And finally, why did I call this Greater Show on Earth? Because, thank you, when I was uh, leaving Singapore, everyone said, why are you going to China? This was 2001. And I honestly couldn't tell them the honest truth was that my son had finished secondary school there. Um, and I wanted to go somewhere else. I hadn't decided where. Um, so I thought of P.T. Barnum's slogan, The Greater Show on Earth. Because it really is the greatest show on earth. For anyone interested in economics, business, and I would even argue um, the future um, of the world. Uh, probably one of the most ugly acronyms, which hopefully you haven't come across, uh, but I've come across, is VUCA, which stands for Volatility, Uncertainty, Complexity, and Ambiguity. Or as I think of it as e increasingly violent, unpredictable, chaotic, and alarming. Because those are the times that we live in. And not just these, this isn't just one or two years. Um, this is um, a decade or two. So why is this the greatest show on Earth? Um, and why does this relate to why the economy has not collapsed? Uh, simply it's because traditional philosophy has actually lit the way. And also le learning lessons from the past. I mean, China has collapsed spectacularly in the past um, and may do so again, um, but not necessarily uh, in our lifetimes. So what's my final lesson? What China can give us is some practical thinking for today. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Hugh. I can see you had to um, compress a lot of material into a, into a very short presentation. So thank you. Um, thank you for that. We've only got about 10 minutes for questions. Um, so I think we'll go straight into it if we've got some microphones. Anybody have a... A question for you? Um, yes, right back there. Um, thank you. Hugh, thank you for a spectacularly good talk. Um, I know you, I notice you avoided the uh, question that's been dominating a lot of the media, which is when or if China will overtake the USA. Um, <clears throat> do you have any views on that in terms of absolute uh, GDP? Well, of course, <laughs> but whether I'm right, the future will only tell me. And frankly, the people who've done the calculation come to the same conclusion. Sometime around 2023, certainly 2035. Of course, that largely depends on what the US economy does between now and then, as opposed to China's economy. Um, but why should we be surprised? I mean, I was reading in uh, the South China Morning Post a review of the Harvard book on, you know, whatever it's called anyway. 2,000 words on every topic you need to know about China. And one of the academics was saying, you know, China should realize that it is as complex as the US. And I thought, no, how can that be? China's four times bigger. And it's probably exponentially more complex than the US is. We've just got to get our heads around the fact of what that what 1.4 billion people um, are frankly going to do to themselves and then as a consequence the rest of the world. 
And when I was writing the introduction, those of you who've written books will know this, um, it's only at the end, when you write the introduction, you actually start to understand what the book's about. And I found myself writing something I'd never even thought about before. Most people think that the Communist Party of China runs China. And I realized, no, it doesn't really. Um, so who does run China? Um, well, first of all, it's basically the consumers. And meeting their expectations of what is driving China today and is driving political stability. It's the old thing development economists would talk about, uh, meeting rising expectations. So, okay, so how do we meet consumer expectations? With SOEs? Probably not. Um, so how are we going to do it? Well, we have the private sector. And so how does the private sector, which now dominates the economy, contrary to what most people think, it's all about SOEs, it's the private sector, go there for goodness sake. Um, and it's all, they dominate all the new industries. Um, but how do they satisfy the consumers? Because, again, most people in Hong Kong probably know this, Chinese consumers are the most demanding on earth, let me tell you. Um, and they won't put up with rubbish because they put up with rubbish for not just 60 years, but the best part of 150. Um, so how do you actually uh, get the consumers satisfied? You have the buzzword of the last three years, innovation. So that's really what's driving it to me. So I think China gets you know, to 6%, let's just say, GDP by the end of the decade, and the average for the next decade, probably 5%. Thank you. Um... Uh, yes. Um, sorry, just introduce yourself briefly, uh, Hansha. Yeah. Hi, I'm Toh Hanshi, a freelance re a reporter. Uh, just to ask a very cynical question, would you say the reason China's economy has not collapsed is because it's uh, shut off its, um, um, cur um, it, its uh, capital control, it's imposed capital controls and not made a currency fully convertible? Um, yes and no. Um, the first lesson it learned from the Asian crisis when Deng Xiaoping saw the dominoes falling from Thailand and all the rest of it and said, we need foreign reserves because this could happen to us. So not only did they have the capital controls, which they had in place anyway, but they raised them hugely. So the answer is that that's a buffer, but they know that that's not going to be sufficient in the long run either. So again, it's upgrading the economy. Now, there comes a point when you can't upgrade it much more. And that's when we get into the interesting stuff, which is essentially the politics and the rest. But again, that comes back to uh, the consumers. And I don't think that Chinese consumers are going to do without things that uh, they know are out there, and they do know that they're out there. Um, yeah, gentlemen, then Doug wants a question. Yeah. <clears throat> Just tell us briefly uh, who you are. Thanks. Okay, uh, Jeff Galbraith, Orient Securities. Um, intellectual property rights, hmm. how China deals with them. Can you elaborate? What's your view? Sure, well, the same way that Taiwan did. I mean, I'm sure that some of you uh, used to go to Cave's bookstore um, and take advantage of very cheap books because it didn't adhere to the Berne Convention, uh, just as America didn't adhere to the Berne Convention. Uh, I remember being shocked in the mid-70s when I read that, uh, as then a, uh, a budding author, H.L. Uh, Mencken saying, well, I got my start in life by reading what were probably, you know, 10 cent novels because they were ripped off from Dickens. Every society goes through it and Taiwan was the same. But then when Taiwan had intellectual property of its own, skin in the game as we call it today, um, then suddenly IP started to change. Caves became an art gallery instead of a bookstore. Uh, I don't know if it still exists. Um, but the fact is that that um, economies change, and China's done the same. I mean, you know, everyone forgets that ZTE each year, for the last two years I think it is, has created the most uh, patents in the OECD of any firm. They've got a lot at stake, and so does Huawei and, and all the others. Uh, Doug, you wanted to ask something? Thank you. I'm Douglas Wong from Bloomberg. Um, it's a, and thank you for your talk in a wonderful book. Um, I've not had a th chance to read it fully, but there are some fantastic uh, insights into Singapore and other parts of Asia as well as China. But to be very parochial, if you, if you don't mind, um, what, what it, my, my sense is that the book is, is, is pretty positive about, the, about China. What's your, what's your um, impression of what Hong Kong's um, short-term outlook is uh, with regard to this background that you paint of the positive 
developments in China. Well, if I'd shown the last slide, you'd have said, I, I don't know how it ends. I still don't. Um, because, you know, China's GDP per capita is one-fifth of that of Singapore and the US. So are people going to be happy with that forever? Maybe not. Okay. But, um, of course, so the Hong Kong answer. Well, I just go back to traditional philosophy. What are Hong Kong people's goals? I, I don't even know if uh, 2047 is written in stone. But people have got to think about that, right? And then work backwards, rather like, you know, senior official uh, in Beijing uh, answered my question about what are they going to do, you know, lots of policies for rural China. People just have to think it through. We can't be doing all this short-termism. We've got to be doing the long term. Now, I'm sure that some people are. But I think a lot of people and a lot of the you know, narrative, not just on Hong Kong, but on everything in the world, is so short term. And this started long before Donald Trump. Thank you. Yes, right at the back there on the veranda. Yeah. Um, Richard Wallace. Um, I run an independent research uh, operation in Hong Kong uh, for many years. I had the great pleasure of talking to my managers in the presence of a great speaker, Mr. Hugh Payman. Sorry, Hugh Payman, a big one. Um, Hugh, sorry, that wasn't meant to be a joke. That was a it was an unfortunate slip of the tongue. Hugh, um, we used to very often get questions that said, um, what does Beijing want to do? Um, and you would basically say, well, Beijing doesn't really control the rest of China. China controls itself and the consumer leads to a certain extent. To what extent has Beijing more control now than it did 10 years or so ago when we were talking to fund managers about the huge change mm. that was about to unfold in China? Yeah. Um, more, um, but the mountains still are high and the emperor is far away. And don't forget that um, there are more uh, provinces and autonomous regions in China than there are days in the month. Um, so if you're in Beijing, you can probably give every province, which could be seething with discontent if they get it wrong, uh, less than one day's attention. Not easy, okay? Um, but also what I come back with, why we shouldn't be surprised, I didn't mention it in this, I talk about it in the book, is every time that China has recovered, um, it has centralized power. Because it's always been about uh, fragmentation uh, in the peripheries. So whether it's the Sui uh, uh, Tang or the Song or even uh, the Ming for a time and certainly the Qing, it's all been um, about centralizing power. And, and also administration, and then recognizing the truth that the mountains um, are high and the emperor is far away. Um, thanks. Can I, uh, can I ask you to clarify something? I'm a bit confused about whether you think China is, is special or not. You know, when I first read the blurb, I thought you were going to be rather sort of orientalist and talk about special Asian values and Chinese values, but then you said very clearly... Um, there is no special Chinese exceptionalism. There is no special DNA. But then you said China um, has long-term thinking to handle complexity. And the implication of that is clearly that other countries don't have that long-term thinking. So is that what you think, that, that basically the US and Europe and others don't have this quality that China has for handling change, this ability to think long-term? Add the one word today. Abraham Lincoln risked the United States in 1861 to have a civil war because he didn't believe in slavery. That was a pretty big deal, right? Um, if you think about Helmut Kohl reunifying Germany, it was a pretty big deal. So it's not that people don't have all these things that I mentioned in the processes of change, um, vision, long-term thinking, 360-degree thinking. Um, I don't want to get into the whole question, that's a totally separate debate, of you know, what is the world of not just social media, but the rise of celebrity and uh, instant news and all the rest of it, actually done to our, th our thinking and our thought processes. Um, but... I would argue that Germany still has um, long-term thinking. I mean, Industry 4.0 isn't a Chinese concept, but it's identical to concepts that Chinese have. So that would really be my point. And if one's in the West, I'd be saying what you can learn from China today is not necessarily about how you control this, that, or the other. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is go back to the things that particularly in the 19th century and first half of the 20th century were the the foundations, basically, of Western economic dominance. Thank you very much. Um, I think that's a... Oh, uh, okay, last two questions. We, are, we have run out of time, but um, 
uh, this gentleman first, and then uh, Philip, I think, over there, yeah. Uh, Tony Watson, Hong Kong Society of Financial Analysts. Demographics. What policies uh, is the Chinese government putting in place to maintain uh, economic growth, prosperity, and probably most importantly, social harmony, given a rapidly aging pol uh, uh, population, one that will probably get old before it gets rich, and one that's going to start shrinking very soon? Mm. Well, first of all, what can it do? I mean, what's the reproduction rate in Hong Kong these days? No. It, yeah, 1.3, 1.4. Okay, and it's been like that forever, Singapore the same. People will decide. Yeah. Uh, last question. Um, F Philip Baring, yeah, uh, there, yeah. yeah. Uh, Philip Baring, a freelance uh, columnist. <clears throat> Actually, my question was also in demographics, but I, I really don't see how you re relate long-termism, which you talk a lot mm. about, to the evolution of population policy and the uh, gen uh, gender divide in China. Yeah. Um, I, I completely get the gist of your question. Again, this comes back to what's the key priority. The key, pri key priority was to stop the population getting too great. Then it was a question of the gradualism, and it still was, well, we still want GDP growth, so we need bodies. Um, but on the other hand, we have to be able to um, manage the situation. So they were conflicted. Everything in, the, in managing change is a work in progress. You don't turn on the light and suddenly 1.4 billion people do what you want. Now we've got to the position where they make it possible to have two per uh, two children, um, and the fact is that a lot of people in urban China have decided they don't want to you, largely for economic reasons, the same. Um, so I would say think of all this not in terms of is China always long term, it's a question of, and again in the, in the book I've stressed it more than here, uh, it's China identifying uh, priorities, very clear priorities, and if it's above another priority, uh, then the top one gets the precedence. And for the best part of 30 years, uh, China uh, has given uh, unfettered growth uh, the number one slot. And then when it was no longer the number one slot because um, of what are now called the contradictions, i.e. environmental degradation and quite a few other things, then it changes. Um, I suppose the good news for China, which they certainly wouldn't have thought about, I don't think, when they were considering changing the policy, um, is the very rapid emergence of artificial intelligence. Uh, so that actually they don't need as many people as one would have conventionally thought even 10 years ago, five years ago, possibly. So that would be my answer. And it could be the thing that brings down China. As I say, I'm, I'm totally um, open to the fact that they've got to keep this thing going for um, the best part, I would say, of 70 years from 1978 till mid-century. Thank you very much. I think that's a very good note to end. Hugh, thank you so much for your contribution. Um, uh, Hugh, Hugh uh, you will be available um, out here to sign books. Yes, absolutely. Like all good authors, he's always willing to sign books. Now, we, we always have um, one of two gifts that we give to our attendees. Uh, one is a mug and one is a tie, and you'll never guess which one this is. <laughs> Thank you. I hope okay. you notice yeah. I wore a tie for you. You're good. Excellent. Thanks good. a lot. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks.